It is such a blessing to hear everything that's going on and, and uh, see the fruit of Mike and Carrie and what's happening. And You know, uh, those of you that, uh, our students know this, but those of you that aren't students yet, I have to tell people when I'm excited because I'm always like this. <laughs> you know, I had a guy give me a $93,000 car. And I just didn't say anything. I was just so blessed. I didn't have anything to say. I just, uh, you know, I had a $14,000 Rolex given to me. And I said, I believe God's going to bless you back a hundredfold. And I just look like this all the time. <laughs> we went to Disney World, took my family. And, you know, on those rides on the roller coaster, they get you in these places. Something comes out at you and everybody screams and they take a picture and then they want to sell that. You could have taken a picture of me right now, and that's exactly the way I was. So, I may not look like it, but I'm telling you, I am really blessed at what God is doing. It's just awesome, and I'm so thankful that y'all are coming and thinking about being a part of it. You know, we've got a lot of people here this morning that weren't here last night, and so I think I am going to give you an opportunity to give this morning, and uh, we're going to receive an offering. We received an offering last night for the building and uh, I would encourage you to participate. And let me use this one scripture out of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I, last night I used 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 8. That says, and, the God, and God is able to make all of grace abound towards you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. And this is what prosperity is for. It's not so you can just get more, but so that you can be a bigger blessing. So that's what we talked about last night. And today I want to use this verse in verse 10. They're passing out these envelopes. This is for cash giving or if you're going to give by a credit card. If you're giving by a check, you can make it out to Andrew Womack Ministries. And the information on there will be sufficient. But in verse 10 it says, Now he that ministers seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. And there's a lot of things to say about that, but God gives seed to sowers. And this isn't really talking about just physical seed and sowing it in the ground. This is using all of this to describe givers. God gives money to people who are givers. And the problem is most people are not really givers. Most people give a little bit every once in a while. They give when it's convenient. They give when there's something special going on. But there's a difference between being a sower and an eater. All sowers have to eat. So I am not saying that there's anything wrong with us having needs and asking God to supply our needs, but there are some people that they're like a vacuum cleaner that's just always sucking towards them. Everything is praying about, oh God, I need more, 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 more. There's some people that that's really descriptive of their whole life. There's other people that are just givers. They live to give. And givers have to also receive. If you just constantly gave and never received anything, you would come to an end of being able to give. So there's nothing wrong with receiving. But if you give to get, that's wrong. But givers need to know that they need to get too so that they can be a bigger blessing. So you ought to give to get so you can give. That ought to be the emphasis. And so there are some people that just live to give. There's some people that are thinking about how can I be a blessing to somebody else? And there's other people thinking about how can somebody else bless me? And this says God gives seed to sowers. God, it says First Chronicles 16, 9, that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth seeking to show himself strong in behalf of those who are perfect in his sight. Did you know God is looking throughout the entire world? God's here today looking. Is there anybody who wants to be a blessing? Is there anybody who you would rather give than you had receive? And again, there's nothing wrong with receiving so that you can be a bigger giver, but your focus is on giving. And when God finds somebody like that, he gives money to people who will give. So you can turn this around and say it this way. If you're short of money... God doesn't see you as a giver. God sees you as a taker, as an eater. Because if he can find people that you live to give, you want to be a blessing, he will give seed to sowers. 
And let me give this one quick testimony and then we'll receive the offering. But I was in uh, Merritt Island, Florida, and there's a pastor there, Dan Stahlbaum. I went to his church for 10 years or more in a row. And uh, this when we were doing a building program down in Colorado Springs, and he wanted to be a giver. He was a sower. And he wanted to be a big giver. And so he prayed about it. He had about three or 400 people in his church. And God put on his heart that they were supposed to give me a $50,000 offering for this building out of three or 400 people. And that's a huge offering. Most churches of three or 400 do not give you $50,000. And uh, so anyway, on Sunday morning, he got up and read this verse. And he said, how many of you believe God will give seed to you if you're a sower? And everybody, amen. And he says, all right, I want you to to commit to it. He says, I'm going <clears> to <throat> believe God for $50,000 this week. And if God gave you $1,000 this week, $1,000 or more, and he emphasized God gives seed to the sower and bread for the eater. He'll never give you just what you need to give. He'll also give you something to eat along with it. He says, if God was to give you $1,000 this week, how many of you would sow it into this offering and give it to Andrew for his building program? And so he had people start standing up, and he had them stand up, and there was over 50 people that made this commitment that if God will give me $1,000, I'll sow it into the deal. So that was on Sunday morning. By Sunday afternoon, people had already started receiving $1,000. There was like 10 testimonies by Sunday night of people that had a over a thousand, every one of them had over a thousand dollars come in and they gave that thousand. So boy, it picked up momentum, momentum, all kinds of people see were wanting to get in on this because now they were getting these supernatural supplies. And there was one man who, uh, he and his wife wrote out a check on Monday morning and they prayed over it and then they were going to give it in the offering on sun, uh, Monday night. But when he went to work, on Monday morning, his boss called him in and said, we're reorganizing everything and we're eliminating this department and we're eliminating your job. But he says, we like you so much that we decided to create an, a brand new area for you and we want to put you in the management over that. And he increased his pay $4,000 a month on a regular basis. And this guy came and gave the testimony. All of a sudden, everybody was wanting to get in and do this and did you know I forgot the exact number but I know it was over fifty five thousand dollars that they wound up giving me and every one of those came in by people who just said God if you'll give it to me I'll give and it's amazing a lot of people don't understand this but the Lord is looking for people not just this one time but just as a lifestyle if you would get to where you live to give instead of give to live you would see a supernatural prosperity come through you. And I really credit this a lot to how God has blessed me. It's because, man, we give. You can go to our website, get anything we've got free of charge. We give away over 50% of everything that everything people ask for. We give it away free and we give. We give away hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash per month to people all over the world. And we just give, give, give. And you cannot outgive God. God is just blessing me and a part of it's because I'm a sower and he always blesses us and I tell you you need to get in on this money is not just so you can use it for yourself it's so that you can give somebody says well if I did that I'd have nothing well that's not the way it works you seek first the kingdom of God God will add all of these things to you and the things listed there in Mark Matthew chapter 6 are what you eat what you, where, where you sleep and what you're clothed with God will take care of your physical needs if you'll take care of his kingdom God will take care of your kingdom and he'll do a better job than you do God is El Shaddai not El Chipo and he will bless you and provide for things better than you would ever provide for yourself amen so, Father, we love you, and we just thank you. I praise you for these scriptures, and I pray that you touch people's hearts here today and help them to get out of just thinking about themselves and always wanting something for themselves. Father, I pray that they would lift up their head, lift up their eyes, and look out on other people, that they would want to be a blessing. That, Father, they would want to bless somebody else. I pray that you just put this desire in people's hearts. And we believe that as people become sowers, 
And Father, you'll give seed to sowers, that you'll supply every single thing that we need. And we agree and thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You can receive the offering. You know, as we were praying, I really felt like the Lord was saying there's some people in here that uh, you have a desire to come to school. You have a desire for this $100 deposit and you don't quite have it. And you know what you need to do? You need to take what you've got that is not enough. If what you have is not enough for your need, turn it into a seed and plant it and it'll grow and multiply. And I felt like the Lord was saying, if you don't have enough money for registration, take what you've got and give it to somebody else who wants to register and turn it into a seed and it'll grow and you'll see God supernaturally supply. Amen. So that's good. You know, when I needed a car, I started buying cars for other people and I would make their monthly payments. I didn't have enough money to give them the total thing. So I'd tell them, you go buy a car and I'll make your payments. And I started making other people's payments on cars because I needed them. <laughs> Man, some people think that's weird. <laughs> you know what? For over 12 years, I had a man buy me cars and make all of my payments for over 12 years. I didn't do it for that reason. I just did it because I had a need and I planted a seed for the need that I had. And since then, you know, we buy all of our cars debt free. I told you I just had a $93,000 yeah, $93, Cadillac Escalade given to me. Uh, and I, you just can't out give God. You ought to try it. Man, don't gripe about it or, or complain until you try it. Try it. You'll like it. It's awesome. You know, I just want to again say thanks to everybody for everything you're doing. And Carrie, that was awesome. Man, I love Mike and Carrie. They're awesome people. And you know, the verses that totally changed my life, Romans 12, 1 and 2, Carrie was basically describing Romans 12, 1 about just becoming a living sacrifice, running up a white flag, making an absolute unconditional surrender. God, I'm yours. And it just makes life so awesome because you don't argue over anything. You know, I was listening to Happy Caldwell. I don't know how many of you know him, but Happy Caldwell just gave up his church. He spent 30 something years building. I forget how much money all of his facility is actually worth, but it's over $30 million. And he, had, he and his wife, Jeannie, have spent an entire life building this up. And Happy is, I'm not sure exactly how old he is, but he's in his 70s, I think. And the Lord just spoke to Happy about giving it all up, turning it over, and just, he gave it to somebody else. It's theirs. And he, he doesn't have a thing to do with it anymore. It's not him in an apostolic role still running. He just gave it to somebody else and the Lord told him to start a new ministry. And he's now building a nationwide television network and doing other things. And it's 70 something, he's back to square one, starting over from the beginning because this is what God told him to do. And he got up at Copeland's Minister's Conference and preached a message about how that we need to raise up the younger generation. We need to start transitioning. We don't need to go until we're out of gas and see the ministry die. And, and it was powerful what he was sharing. And at the end, he gave an invitation about how many of you would be willing if God speaks to you to just give up everything that you've spent your entire life building and doing all of these things. And he gave an invitation. And you know what? I, I sat there and the invitation was, would you just evaluate? Is God telling you to give all this up and walk away and do something else? And it didn't take, but I don't know, five seconds maximum. And I said, God, I'd walk away from everything you've given me. I'll go to Russia. I'll go to Africa. I'll live in a grass hut if that's what you want me to do. And I'm serious. I'd walk away from this in a heartbeat. Now, this is not what God's telling me to do. He's confirmed to me that I got a lot more to do. So this is not my swan song and me exiting. <laughs> but I'm just saying, there is no conflict. I would walk away from this. If Daniel could run this school better than I could, I would give this school to him in a heartbeat and say, Daniel, God told me that you're supposed to do this. I don't have any agenda. It is such an awesome way to live that you're just free. And if something isn't working, 
Well, likewise, I don't feel that this is my ministry and that God is making, you know, that I'm trying to get God to do things. If something didn't work, I go to God. God, what do you want to do? This is your problem. It's not my problem. I'm telling you, that was awesome. You know, Mike and Carrie live that message better than she preached it. And she preached it good, but they live it. And they are willing to do anything. And God spoke some things to me while you were talking today. I need to go talk to Mike and Carrie. It's awesome. But you know what? You just, once you do that, if God says do something, you just do it. But if I do this, this could happen. It doesn't matter what the results are. I've had people before, are you realizing that you could fail? Well, who cares? If I don't obey God, I've already failed. I'm telling you, you, if you feel like God's telling you to do something and you struggle and have to debate, you haven't become a living sacrifice. It's not you. I mean, it is you living instead of Christ living in you. And you just need to get past that. And then what Paul said this morning about, well, I thought this was a great word from God. I never looked at it that way. But you don't have... You don't have to seek understanding. What you seek is peace. And then you let the peace of God that passes understanding keep your heart and mind. Boy, that was a great word. And then what Greg followed it up with and and expounding on letting, uh, you know, giving the, God giving you the desires of your heart. I'm telling you, this really spoke to me. Gets me fired up. I'm about ready to join Karis. I could sit on the front row if I signed up. I tell you what, this is awesome. If the world could understand what's been said during this thing, it would just transform people's lives. But you've got to believe it. Faith without works is dead. You've got to act on it. You know, I want to share some things with you this morning uh, that go along with all of these things that have been said. Uh, We've been talking, Greg was really trying to emphasize that Don't be immature and have to have carnal, physical things to confirm all of these things that God's speaking to you. It's really a step of maturity when you get to where you just let the peace of God rule in your heart. You you follow the desires of your heart. And I really agree with that. Now, God knows where you are, and some of you may be in a situation where you need some help along the way. And praise God for His mercy and grace. But you shouldn't live there. You need to be looking for good things. And I want to share with you kind of in, uh, I've only got 26 minutes left. It's amazing. My sessions are the ones that always get cut down. I don't know how that is, but anyway, I've, I've been up more than everybody else, so I guess it works out. But I just want to share with you kind of in a testimony form that on March the 23rd, 1968, is when I finally submitted to Romans 12, 1 and 2, and I made myself a living sacrifice and just committed myself. And boy, when I did that, I mean, God transformed my life. And part of what Carrie was talking about, if you understood how much God loves you, you don't have trouble submitting to him. I felt, I saw, I understood the love of God in a way that it just transformed my life. And one that was on March the 23rd, 1968. I was 18 years old and my birthday's April the 30th. So by the end of that school year, I was in my first year of college I had just turned 19, and the Lord, I just got to where I hated going to school. I was at the University of Texas at Arlington, and I hated it. I can't tell you how much I hated it. I don't know what happened. Prior to that time, I was loving it. I was out on my own, and it was like, you know, I was in my first year of college, and it was fun. But boy, when I had this experience with the Lord, God totally changed the desires of my heart, and I hated going to class. Uh, I don't have the words to tell you. I mean, I hated it. That's all I can say, but I hated it. Did you know for 20-something years after this, I would have nightmares at least once or twice a year. Every six months, I dreamed that I was back in college and that the bell was ringing and I had to go to class and I would wake up in a cold sweat and I just, I mean, it was a nightmare. 
And uh, I finally, I went to a church here in Green Mountain Falls and Dan Funkhauser, who's one of the instructors in our school, uh, Dan is a unique guy in many ways, but Dan just doesn't give a rip what anybody else thinks. I've never met a guy that was as secure as Dan and just didn't care about anything. I mean, we'd be over at his house and he'd come out in his bathrobe at nine o'clock and he says, I'm going to bed. Y'all turn the lights off when you get through and he'd go to bed. He wouldn't care what anybody else did. He just would go to bed and he invited me to come speak in his church and I said, Dan, what happened? He wanted me to be, uh, preach the early service and he would preach the last one. And I said, what happens if the people go to like in my ministry more than they like your ministry? And he says, if they like you better than me, he says, I'll give the church to you and I'll go down the street and start another one. He says, you just do what God wants you to do. So anyway, I was really learning from Dan about just being secure. And anyway, I had one of these nightmares where I was back in school and the bell was ringing and I couldn't find my locker and I couldn't find where I was supposed to go. And, I, and this is the only time out of 20 something years of dreaming about this that I ever made it to class. And I actually made it into the classroom and I was sitting there and it, you know, I, anyway, I don't want to give you all these details, but it was significant. God was speaking some awesome things to me. And I was sitting there thinking, God, what am I doing here? You told me to quit school. And I looked over and Dan Funkhauser was sitting next to me. And I said, what are you doing here? And he said, the question is, what are you doing here? You know what God told you. Why do you care what people think about you? And he says, let's get out of here. And I said, okay. And so we got up and we walked to the door. And as we got to the door, I stuck my head back inside and yelled to the whole class. I said, this is the last time I'll ever have this dream. And I walked out. And it's the last time I ever had that dream. It set me free. But anyway, right after I had this experience with the Lord, I just hated going to school and I couldn't figure out what was going on and I was back and forth and struggling with it and I would get together with my friends at night and we would study the word till two or three in the morning every single night and we read Romans 14, 23 that says, whatsoever is not a faith is sin. And when I saw that, it was the first time that had ever really come alive to me and I realized I wasn't in faith. I was vacillating back and forth. And an indecision is sin. I needed to make a decision. And see, I had kind of thrown out this thing about, I think I'm gonna quit school. And when I said that, boy, my mother, she knew for sure then that I was of the devil. And uh, she didn't talk to me for two weeks. And finally, I took her out to a steak place. I fed her a meal and I said, you are gonna say something to me. And she started crying and she says, I'm just so ashamed of you and what you're doing. And she just broke down and cried all night long. And so because of her reaction, I was single at the time, I was living at home. Uh, it, my mother and I were super close. My dad died when I was 12 years old. And, my mother was like my best friend, and so I didn't want to do things to her, so I was staying in school. And then I went and I mentioned it to other people. I mentioned it to my youth director. I mentioned it to the pastor of the church. I mentioned it to a lot of people. And every single person, without exception, that I told them I was thinking about just quitting school, they told me I was crazy. This was during the height of the Vietnam War. And uh, if, you, if you went to school, you had a student deferment. And I had a student deferment as long as I stayed in college. So if you quit college, it was like a guarantee that you were gonna get drafted and sent to Vietnam. Plus I got $350 a month from the government out of my dad's social security if I went to school. So I was gonna lose $350 a month and I was gonna lose uh, you know, possibly my family, the respect of all of these people, everybody was telling me I was wrong. So there was a lot to lose. And because of it, I stayed in school and kept going through the motions, but I hated it. And then when I saw this verse about whatsoever is not a faith is sin, I stayed over to these people's house usually till two or three every morning. But that night I went home about eight o'clock and I said, I'm in sin. 
I'm, I'm feeling one thing, but I'm not acting on it. I've got to make a decision. And I said, I'm going to go home. And I said, I'm not going to be living in sin tomorrow. I'm going to make a decision. So I went home and I started praying and I said, Father, I'm sorry, but I don't know what to do. And I said, what am I supposed to do? And it's like Greg was talking about. You know, I was praying and God, I need a word from you. And I just wasn't hearing anything. So I prayed from like eight o'clock till midnight or something. And finally, uh, I just started studying the word. And let me turn over and show you this one passage. The Lord gave me a bunch of scriptures, but here's one of the main ones out of Colossians chapter three. And in Colossians chapter three, verse 15, it says, let the peace of God rule in your heart to the which ye are also called in one body, and be ye thankful. And the word rule here, I looked it up in the uh, Greek, and it's the same root word that we get the word umpire from. Some translations will translate this this way. Let the peace of God be like an umpire in your life. And here's what the Lord spoke to me. I had to make a decision. And I said, I'm going to make a decision today. I am not going to be in the indecision tomorrow. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you would be better off to make a decision in faith and make the wrong decision and be in error in faith than you would to be safe in unbelief. He told me that it's like a boat that if you are asked, you know, you're wanting to direct, direct that boat, but if that boat is sitting still, you can flip the rudder 360 degrees and it'll never give any direction to the boat. But if it starts moving, even if it's slowly, well, then you can turn that rudder and it'll start directing and giving motion to the deal. And he says, you've just got to head in some direction. And even if you're wrong, I can steer you once you get to operating in faith and I can turn you and get you to where you need to be. But he says, as long as you're in indecision, I can't bear witness. And he said, your peace is like an umpire. And this goes right along with the word from Paul and also Greg this morning, that you need to let peace just call the shots. What is it that you have peace about? And the Lord spoke this to me. And so I said, that's it. I'm going to make a decision. And so I just, with my imagination, I sat down and I thought about, all right, if I stay in school, what's that going to be like? And I felt zero peace, zero peace. I hated it. I thought, God, I can't stay in school. And then I thought, all right, if I quit school, what's going to happen? And I saw me getting drafted. And I saw me losing this money. I saw criticism from people. And you know what? I didn't like that. So I couldn't say that I had total peace about doing that. But finally, I just said, God, I don't have total peace in any direction. And finally, Lord, here's what he told me. And he speaks to people the way that you understand. He may speak differently to you. But he just said, if I put a gun to your head and said, make a decision right now. And if you make the wrong one, I'm going to kill you. If this was life and death, which it could have been life and death, going to Vietnam could have been life and death. And he said, if it's life and death, and if you make the wrong decision, you're going to die. He says, you may not feel total peace, but which one would you do? And man, I said, immediately, I'm quitting school. Because that's the one I felt the most, that's the only one I felt any peace about at all. But I knew that there was a lot of bad things that could come out of it. But anyway, that's the way I did it. I said, I'm going to let the peace of God rule in my heart and I didn't understand how it was going to work out but I just said I, to the best of my ability I am not going to be living in sin tomorrow I made that decision and I went to bed and when I got up in the morning I just thought I'm going to test this and see whether this decision is giving me peace or whether it's going to be causing turmoil and stuff. So I went to the three people who had criticized me the most. One of them was my youth director who uh, was in the prayer meeting the night that God changed my life. He was there and he was seeing the transition that was happening in me and he had been a big factor in my life and he just flat out told me I was of the devil to even say that God wanted me to quit school. He, he jumped on me like a chicken on a June bug. I mean, he just let me have it. So very first thing I did was go see Marion. And I walked in and I didn't try and convince him of anything. I just walked in and I said, I've made my decision. And he says, what is it? 
And I said, I'm quitting school. And I was braced for all his criticism. And he just looked at me and he says, you know what? I think that's the right thing. I was born. And then I went to this other lady. She was a, a, my choir teacher in high school, and she was a good friend of my mother. And she was uh, probably 50, maybe 60 years old, and she was single. She was an old maid school teacher, but she loved the Lord. And I really liked her, and I really respected her. And I was in college, but I went back and told her what the Lord had spoken to me. And because she was a friend of my mother, I guess she decided that she would defend my mother. She knew that my mother didn't want me to quit school. And boy, she just got all over me and told me what a failure and how I was going to destroy my life and do all of these things. So I went in to see Miss Ellis, and I walked in, and I told her, I said, I've made my decision. She said, what is it? And I said, God told me to quit school. And she just looked at me and started crying. I said, what's wrong? And she says, you know, I'm, boy, however old she was, 50 or 60. And she says, I've wanted to live for God, but I don't, I don't know that I've ever had a word from God and known exactly what God told me to do. She says, I envy you so much. And she said, would you please pray for me? And I got to minister to her. And by the end of that day, I had zero doubt ever, ever, ever. And I did get drafted and go to Vietnam. And the whole time I was in Vietnam, I knew that that was just a consequence of what God had told me to do. And I have had the peace of God rule in my heart over that. And I'm telling you, it was one of the most important decisions I've ever made within a month and a half after me really having my encounter with the Lord. It changed my life. As Greg was talking about this morning, I was headed towards being a school teacher in my whole life. This is just the way that life was pushing me and it's where I was going. And making that one decision, less than two months old in really seeking the Lord and making that one decision, put my life on a course that I would have had to have backslid on God to keep from being where I am today. And you know what? I never did get a thus saith the Lord, quit school or anything. It was all about the desires of my heart. My desires changed. And then I let the peace of God rule in my heart. And I tell you, I have done this thousands and thousands and thousands of times since then. And the few times that I've ever violated the peace in my heart, I paid for it. I remember being a pastor in Pritchett, Colorado, and it was a small church of only 10 people when I got there. And then we saw a guy raised from the dead and it grew to 100 people in a town of 144. And anyway, they, the elders were custom combiners that followed the harvest and they were gone six months out of the year. And so they said, you need to have some elders that aren't custom combiners that will stay here with you and run this church. And so they wanted to put this one guy in as elder. And you know what? I didn't have a single thing against him. Matter of fact, when I first came to that church, uh, he was the first person that accepted me. Uh, he and his wife had embraced Jamie and me, and they were supporters of ours. And there was not a single reason in the natural not to put him in, but I didn't feel peace about it. And so I told them, no, I don't want him. They said, well, who else? And I thought, well, I don't know. And I never did come up with anybody. And they, over a period of two or three weeks, they came to me and they said, well, what about this guy? And they finally just pushed it. And, you know, women, I think, follow intuition a lot more than guys do. Guys have to have, have it figured out. It has to be logical. And they were asking me, so give me a reason why he's not a good candidate for And I couldn't give a reason. I didn't have a single thing against him. I just didn't feel peace about it. And they finally intimidated me into it, and they were getting ready to leave. So anyway, we had an ordination service. We ordained him, made him an elder of the church. Everybody left and went on the uh, harvest, uh, following the harvest. 
And the very next Sunday, he got up in front of the church and started blasting me, accused me of committing adultery, stealing money from the church, which I didn't even take a salary from the church. And he accused me of getting drunk and being on dope, and he just started lying about me. He turned into the devil personified. And the moment that happened, I said, I knew I wasn't supposed to do this. And I made a decision. That was back in 19... 78 I said from this time on I'm not going to violate the peace that I have in my heart I don't care what the consequences are or how people push me and to the best of my ability I've done what I feel peace about and I, I let that rule my life you know we have decisions all the time here in the ministry and things have to be done but I don't just do it because it's what it looks like you have to do. If I don't feel peace about it, we just don't do it. And we don't do it until I do feel peace about it. I'm telling you, this is one of the ways that Greg was talking about, about being mature. And instead of having God just take you by the hand and speak to you, have a prophecy come or something like that, you need to let the peace of God rule in your heart. And use your imagination. Put your decisions in front of you and with your imagination think, all right, what happens? if I do this and what happens if I do that and you may not feel total peace about anything because uh, it could have some potential uh, bad side effects just like I was explaining to you but if somebody was to put a gun to your head and you were going to die if you didn't make the right decision I bet you every one of you in your heart know which one you feel the most peace about and you know what that is that's God that's God, and this is the way he tells you. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. Umpire. You know, when you throw a ball in baseball, they may not be totally sure. He might think, man, that was so close. I'm not sure if that's a ball or a strike. But he never says, well, let's just do that one over. I wasn't sure. <laughs> you know what part of an umpire is? You just got to make a decision. You just call it ball or strike, and whether you're wrong or not, what the umpire says stands. And that's the way you need to be. None of us are perfect. God knows our imperfections. And again, I go back to that deal about a boat. If you just make a decision, you don't have to go full steam ahead. If you aren't sure, just make a decision and start. start taking the steps you know there's all kinds of applications this isn't limited to coming to Karis but if you were thinking about coming to Karis the, appli the application could be that first step it's a lifetime application and you just say I'm going to take this first step I'm going to apply and you start doing that and then things just start working out and God will start bearing witness with you and show you whether you're right or wrong and he'll guide you and direct you but God is not going to bear witness with indecision it would be better off the Lord told me that I would be better off to make a decision the wrong decision but do it in faith than to not make a decision and be in unbelief God loves faith and you know it's just like a little kid when they start riding a bike none of us do it perfectly Man, you fall, but the parrot doesn't run up and say, you idiot, if you would have done what I told you, you would not have fallen off this bike. That's not the way you teach your kids. Man, you get up and say, hey, you went five feet. You can do it again. Get up and try it again. And you get up and encourage them. You know what? 
You can make mistakes, but God's not going to fall off his throne if you make a mistake. And again, God would bless you just for the fact that, man, you're going you're gonna to step out in faith. You're going to start believing God. God loves faith. You know, I know that all things God's speaking to me about this campus is going to come to pass. This is not a negative confession. But if it didn't come to pass, did you know what? God, I believe, and if I died and went to heaven, he'd be there saying, man, you went for it. Amen. You might have fallen off the back before you got to the end results, but I believe God would be pleased with me for trying rather than just being fearful of making a mistake so I never do anything, only do what I can do and don't depend upon God. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, God is encouraging people to just believe God. Step out. Do something. Do something. Lest you do nothing. Most people are shooting at nothing and hitting it every time. Man, you need to shoot at something. God is stirring people up. Amen. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus... I just pray that you take these few things, the things that you've done in my life and the scriptures that I've shared, and I ask you to speak to people who are having to make a decision. And right now, help them to let the peace of God rule in their heart. Father, we believe that whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Father, we are not going to respond to fear, to worry, to any of these things. We respond to faith. And Father, whatever it is that you're speaking to people about taking a step of faith, I believe that you are helping people to let that peace rule in their heart and to follow this peace of God. And we trust you, Father. Philippians 3.15, if we're otherwise minded in anything, you will reveal it unto us. So, Father, I thank you.